This program is brought to you by the partners of A Root Awakening International. Help others find truth. Support A Root Awakening International today. While questionable happenings emerge one after the other around the world, Yehovah is preparing his people for a Goshen experience in the midst of an end time Egypt. How will we as believers get through it and even maybe benefit from it? Well, David Lopez opens our eyes to some interesting opportunities because it's the end of the sixth day. The sun is set and this is Shabbat Night Live. Shabbat Shalom, Torah fans. What a week. Welcome to Shabbat Night Live with Michael Rood. So if you're not ready for an exodus, you'd better watch tonight's episode because Yehovah is getting us ready for a Goshen experience where he will protect us from our enemies and alert us to what is ahead. So we have to be paying attention. David Lopez shares some interesting opportunities you need to know about right now that can help with that. So it's the second and final episode of Crisis Upon Crisis in which we will show you all of that. But first, let's talk about the astronomically and agriculturally corrected biblical Hebrew calendar. There you see it there on your screen. It's the third Shabbat of the fifth month. Let's talk about what happened this week in history with my co-host, our partner services director, David Robinson. Hello, hello. Good hello, to be here. Yep. Good to have you. This week in history, while we're not going to talk about things in U.S. history or right. even, you know, ancient, we're going to talk about Yeshua's history. Biblical history. Biblical history. And that's what we have here with the uh, the chronological gospels. I have my my chronological gospels from Michael. It's starting to get a little beat up. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is the old binding we used to have on it. But uh, yeah, wonderful thing. And uh, this was a very busy week in Yeshua's mm -hmm. ministry. This was, if you look on the scroll, the 70 week timeline scroll, mm -hmm. this was week uh, 25. So that's why I like to use the, uh, the calendar and the scroll and the, and the chronological gospels. And if you do that, that is like a trifecta of information because right. you get to see what week it was happening, uh, what week it was in history. You correlate that with the Bible and then you correlate that with uh, the calendar and you really get a sense of, okay, it was summer. It right. was hot. What was he doing? Gosh, what was he, what were his disciples doing? W you know, were they feeling fatigued or you know what happened? You he can, was really busy. He was really busy, was and you really can busy. and you can really get a sense of that, especially when Michael puts it all in, in perspective, right? Mm -hmm. So, for example, this was week twenty-five. So, what did we see in week twenty-five? So, if you go in any version of the chronological gospels, this is another thing I love what Michael did. He said, "I want to make it the same page." regardless of what size of the Bible you have, the regular size, the big one, mm -hmm. or, the, or the, even the educator's edition, which, um, so David, that one, you guys in, in uh, your fulfillment folks, we put that together right before right. we send it out. Like, mm -hmm. is yeah, that the one with the, has we a binder? and everything, yeah, it has the big binder. Yep. Okay, so you can literally take pages out, yep, you take pages out, them, you can or... copy them, do whatever you want to do. Okay, yeah. great. And that, that's a good one for teaching because that it one is. stays A lot of people that open. have uh, Torah groups, Torah teaching groups, they use that. Okay. Yeah, a lot of our people. And then that way you can have one at the uh, the pulpit or the, mm -hmm. the bima or yeah. whatever you have in your yeah, center. Have it open there all the time. Right. Yeah. And then you can have other people have the same one. And it's you can say, turn to page 109. And you're still at 109 in the educator's, educator or the scholar edition. Oh, in the scholar. Right. Okay, great. So and that, that's where we're actually where we're going today. So Yeshua's week 25 starts on page 108, but it's several pages. <laughs> I want to go through because there's like so much stuff here. Like he went, my goodness, this... Where does this go till? Wow. Okay, so this there's like from page 108 to 114. This was all in one week right. that he did this. So here, here's what Yeshua did in the span of one week. So we started episode, or pardon me, event number 70. Yeshua heals many in the villages around the Canaret. Crowds gather from around the Galilee. You'll find this in Mar uh, Matthew 12, 15 to 21, and Mark, 7, uh, Mark 3, 7 to 12. Uh, and we talk all about that. Then he prays all night on a mountain and gathers his most faithful disciples and ordains the 12 um, as his apostles. And that was, again, the same week. Then he also uh, did the Sermon on the Plain, which right. Michael called, not Sermon on the Mount, Sermon on the Plain, where Yeshua teaches a multitude outside Capernaum. And uh, 
So the interesting note here that Michael has about this. This is Yeshua's very short reiteration of a message that he delivered to relatively few disciples on a mountain near the beginning of his teaching. So that was just five weeks earlier. So that's another thing too, is you realize, or when you're reading through this, you go, well, was this the same event or was mm -hmm. it not? In some cases it is. It is. Yeah. In other cases it's not. This is... Yeah. I think, I think it's really interesting. I think Michael got his, uh, when he used to go to Israel and give the tours, he, 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 he got that from this portion of, his, of uh, Yeshua's walk. Oh, okay, it's, interesting. I mean, how busy he was. Yeah. <laughs> He's just so busy. The tours are always so busy. But Yeshua was very busy doing the work of his father that week. Yeah, indeed. Now, speaking of being busy with the tours, so... Uh, Ryan Morrow and Logan mm -hmm. Keysweater. We just finished with them a couple of weeks mm -hmm. ago, and uh, that's that's an interesting tour. And actually, Michael, uh, if you remember, he was all about, well, I'm not going to be doing tours right now, so right. if you want to do a tour, go to Mount Sinai. He was actually very in favor of that, so if mm -hmm. you want to uh, go to that, uh, make sure you go to the information on the bottom of your screen there that will show it to you one last time. That's where you can go to get that tour of the real Mount Sinai right. that Michael was actually very excited about. Mm -hmm. I'm sure he'd love to, but yeah. he just can't right now. Yeah. But anyway, so... Other but we're thing, believing he will. Yeah. We're believing <laughs> yeah, we're going Yes, back. right. Yeah, he will. Yeah, he will. Absolutely. Uh, other things Yeshua did this week. Wow. So he healed a centurion's servant. Okay, that's very mm -hmm. interesting. So that is something that happens. What else happened this week? Gosh. He just... <laughs> there's so many... I can't believe he did busy some, week. Yeah. So he went... Uh, he raised a widow's dead son. Mm -hmm. uh, this is when... John the Baptist was offended. He was in the, in the prison and said, well, is he the son of God or right. isn't he? What is it? Uh, so that was part of it. And also, he had supper with a Pharisee named Shimon. And this is where an unnamed woman washed Yeshua's feet with her tears and anointed them with oil. So there you go. This yeah. all happened in one week. One week. So I tell you how busy Yeshua was. No wonder he had to go off on a mountain and pray by himself <laughs> sometimes. Right. Goodness sakes. Okay, so we have just a couple of minutes left. And so, David, we just wanted to tell folks about this uh, love gift that we yeah, have. Yeah, absolutely. It involves a teaching from um, David Lopez. Mm -hmm. He's a former Navy SEAL. And uh, he is a bona fide Navy SEAL. And yeah, he, he knows is. some stuff. Yes, he is. And so he wants to tell us what's uh, coming up on the world stage. He has some inside info. He's actually very big on cryptocurrencies. He knows what he's talking about. I'm really interested in that. I really want to. Yeah, he, he really explained that. it. You know, I still don't get a lot of this, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of the, the different forms of exactly. crypto. Exactly. Yeah, different yeah. forms of crypto and the whole uh, blockchain thing mm -hmm. and all that. He yeah. knows all about that kind of stuff. So if you're interested in that, uh, first of all, we have the, the episode tonight, mm -hmm. but also there's a love gift teaching that kind of talks about uh, different aspects of that. And that's what this is, kingdom come. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, are the kingdoms of this world driving us to kingdom come? Right. That's what right. it's talking about. So that is the uh, gift for $50 or more. We also have a couple of other gifts. Yeah, the, and, the book, the Promised Land book, which we've yep. talked about. And we also have the anointing oil. This is for a gift of 100 Okay. Uh, or more if you'd like, or and this is for, you get all of this all for a gift of 300 or okay. more. There we go. And uh, this is a beautiful book, uh, Colorization of the Wood Engravings gravings of Cousteau uh, Doré. Okay. And um, we could go deeper into that, but I don't right. think we have time. But no, anyway. yeah, we're going to let the commercial do the talking. All right. Yeah, yeah there you go. <laughs> all right, here's a little bit of what you're going to see tonight. Let's not let our love of what our country could be replace our desire for the kingdom that is coming. Mm. Okay, there you go. So, Yehovah is preparing his people for a Goshen experience in the midst of an end-time Egypt, if you will. So, how will we as believers get through it and maybe even benefit from it? Well, David Lopez opens our eyes to some very interesting opportunities, so stay with us. Are the kingdoms of this world driving us to kingdom come? Former Navy SEAL David Lopez shares an enlightening perspective on what's happening on the world stage. You'll learn who the major players are, why justice seems unattainable, and how the kingdom of Yehovah wins in the end. How is God gonna redeem this world and make this new world? He's not gonna wanna destroy the righteous with the wicked. We know from Abraham's discourse that he doesn't. Well, he's separating us right now off of a very simple decision. Kingdom Come with David Lopez will give you a greater understanding as to how technology and systematic crises are being used to condition your choices. This special teaching is our gift to you for supporting A Rude Awakening International. We'll send you Kingdom Come with David Lopez on DVD or Blu-ray when you give a love gift donation of $50 in August. 
donate $100 and we'll send you Kingdom Come, plus a coffee table book containing breathtaking 19th century artwork of famous stories in the Bible. Or donate $300 and we'll send you The Teaching, The Bible Story Coffee Table Book, and a decorative glass box featuring artwork of the Tree of Life and three vials of anointing oil, frankincense, myrrh, and Rose of Sharon. These gifts are available for a limited time from Michael Rood to thank you for your support. Make your donation today and receive the $50 gift, the $100 gift, or the $300 gift. These special gift collections are available only in August and supplies are limited. Get these exclusive thank you gifts now from Michael Rood. Call 888-766-3610. That's 888-766-3610. Or get your gifts online at monthlylovegift.com. When the resurrected saints are gathered together on the sea of fire and glass for the 10 days of awe, the 10 days of inspection, and then getting dressed for the marriage supper of the Lamb, we wait to hear if our name is called into the marriage supper of the Lamb, into the Mishkan in heaven, where Yeshua will sit at the head of the table, where as John says, he sees the Ark of the Covenant, the throne of Yeshua, and he is sitting on it and we go into the marriage supper of the Lamb, and this is when Yeshua's promise is finally fulfilled. He told his disciples on the night of the Last Supper, when he blessed the Most High with the prayer of the Melech Zadik, Baruch Atah Yehovah, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Hamotzi Lechem, Min Ares. He said, this is my body which is broken for you. I am your provision. By my stripes, you will be healed. And then Yeshua, as he took his cup and he passed it around to his disciples, he said, I will not drink this again till I drink it with you, my Father's kingdom. The marriage supper of the Lamb, Yeshua will take his cup and he will say again, this represented and still represents the renewing of the covenant, the covenant that offered to make you priest and kings I paid the death penalty. I paid the price for the broken covenant. And now, now you get to drink with me in my Father's kingdom. You are the ones that are going to live and reign with me upon the earth for a thousand years because I paid the price. Until the marriage supper of the Lamb, we do this in remembrance of him. Shabbat Shalom. So if you look at the last couple of years, I bet you're thinking, whew, made it through that one. Glad we're not gonna do that ever again. Yeah, you just wait. There's a whole lot more being planned, yes, planned. It's not a conspiracy theory. This is reality. There are things in place that are going to happen. And we want to prepare you for some of that as best we can with David Lopez. David, welcome back to Shabbat Night Live. Thanks for having me. You know, we were talking all about uh, blockchain technology uh, last week and uh, Bitcoin and things of this nature. And maybe some people, including myself, have not really waded into that just yet. But we need to. We need to keep our eyes open. We need to be those who are uh, taking the chances. We also mentioned that freedom and 
safety or freedom and security are two different things. You know, uh, you, you use your freedom to create security, but it's this whole revolving, uh, <laughs> revolving door that you can't just live in that space forever. You've always got to have those who are on the edge, creating new things, new ideas. And Yehovah wants us to be those people. You know, uh, we also mentioned Josh Hawley is one who's very staunch about uh, entrepreneurs. Yehovah's people are meant to be those folks. We're meant to be the leaders, the head, not the tail, all that type of thing. Uh, the ones that take risks, keep our eyes open, uh, leading the pack, so it were, as it were. So we want to bring out some information for folks so that they can be those type of people, just even intellectually, and keep their eyes open and see what's going coming down the pipe. So international law, uh, World Economic Forum, the World Health Organization, all these things have been uh, showing their hands to us in the last little while. So... You know, we don't need to fear these things. We just need to take note. Is that right? Well, I think we do need to be aggressive uh, in terms of, you know, our, our attitude. I think a lot of people, when they study end times scripture, they get caught up in this almost sci-fi scenario that they've created for themselves. And it's like, well, what can I do? And, it's kind of, and, and I think we should be aggressive. We have a lot of information that a lot of people don't have about what we, specific things that we know will happen and which way they happen, we don't know. But I think, I think most people have been, uh, over these last two years, if they weren't religious, they probably did become a little bit religious in some ways, right? They've started to go, well, you know, maybe those things I heard back when I was growing up <laughs> might be true. But um, we've got to, you know, I think a lot of people get this mindset where they get nervous, they, we, over, we over-diagnose and talk about who this enemy is and we make it sound like they're so, you know, elite and they're just so like spooky. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really silly because these people are being fooled. They're fooling themselves. And at the end of the day, what they're accomplishing is going to redeem this world. Mm -hmm. And they're going to be a part of that plan, whether they know it or not. They're gonna feel like they've won but um, they're not done. And it, we should be able to look at that and we should be able to kind of digest that a little bit. I know a lot of people, when I hear them, when I say that, they're thinking, oh my gosh, I can't do another two years of what I just did. Make no mistake, the last two years are not going to be nearly what the coming years are going to be. They're not even going to be close. But there's amazing things happening right now in the middle of all this. And people that are using their insight, using their wisdom, um, there, there's businesses to be made, there's new alliances to be made, there's um, technology being incorporated into it like Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrencies. But there is a, a, a great schism happening in the world. And we have to be, we cannot be sitting back thinking, well, I'm gonna sit here with my, in my bug out zone by myself. Well, no, we need community. We need to be there for each other, and we need to embrace that larger community that we're starting to see, the other people that stood up for freedom during these years. That's going to be who's with us. And whatever the, wherever we end up migrating to in this world where they preserve freedom, it's going to be with a bunch of other people that maybe don't look like us or sound like us or even believe like us, but we're all going to be thrown into the same mm. little story together. And when we're told, well, this is the new normal, instead of fighting it, just look at it and go, okay. If this is the new normal, what do I need to be doing? Yeah, that's the, I, I think um, we definitely, one, one overarching need in the future is we need to learn to live in a way that makes whatever the government does irrelevant. Hmm. Instead of like fearing what they're gonna do about this, let's just slowly start m moving our life, whether that's, you know, you get into local agriculture or you get into, you know, anything that makes you more sustainable as a person, I think it's time for all of us to at least have one eye focused on how can I be less reliant on, this, on the government so that I don't, you know, so I don't feel like my whole world's being ripped out from under me unless I'm mandated to do something, right. you know? And part of that is going back to, okay, how many people know how to can? 
these days. Not many. Right. So we need to learn that again. Absolutely. I mean, this is why I, I have a Torah community uh, that I go to, and I always brag on these guys because there's this, there's so many, and, and you can see it that there's no way that any person could have brought these folks together. We have a chiropractor. We have a naturopath. I'm in there. We have someone who is an expert on canning. We have uh, communications experts who are former military. We have uh, weapons experts who are former military. We have three different folks who have farms. You know, all these type of things where we're all learning and, you know, donating time to each other to help, yeah, be less reliant on... Sounds like a real community. Sounds like the way community used to be 100 years ago. Mm Mm-hmm. And I think we've definitely, we're, we're missing something there. And so I'll, that's a positive. This, this experience we're all going through is going to eventually push us back into actually having a real community again, right. which I think we need it anyway, regardless of how bad these scenarios mm-hmm. seem to be. And, and that's just it. They're not as bad as they, as they seem to be, like you just mentioned. It's all, it, it brings me back to the, uh, the old, old West. So you go down the Old West, the main street, and there's all these grand looking buildings, but they're all a facade. All it is, is just a big show on the front, and it's a little shack in behind. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and that's what, it's almost like a movie set, where it's not as scary as it sounds. No, it's only scary when you give into it, and when you allow for these voices, whether it be the media or whoever it is, to, to be what you believe in. And mm-hmm. there's, you know, instead of using your reason, using your logic, you know, I find it interesting that, most of the world, and we were talking about this earlier uh, in, in the green room, but most of the world has kind of come to a conclusion that COVID was likely man-made or man-manipulated. But have you noticed that no one really cares? That's pretty remarkable, isn't it? Because right. in journalism, you look for stories and juicy stories that, you know, the biggest, you know, this would be the biggest atrocity mm-hmm. ever, uh, bio attack ever. And now we know it, it more very likely was man-made. Now almost every expert agrees, but yet there isn't the natural sense of curiosity. And because it's not with the media, if you notice it, it's really not in society. Mm-hmm. We only care about, in, in large number I mean, we only really care about what we're told to care about. Even though instinctively everyone should be going, wait, who did do that? If someone made that, why did they, did they you know, yeah. Those are normal questions. Those aren't like crazy conspiratorial mm-hmm. questions, and it might sound like it is, but that's a, that's a very normal response to a terrible atrocity, but yet it's not there. And I think a part of this is we're fatigued from the crisis. No mm-hmm. one wants to go back there in their mind the last two years. We want to think, oh, that's over with, on to the you know, bright, beautiful, sunny future. Mm-hmm. And I think the future is full of possibility. And we're going to have, and I, I, I'm not saying it's going to be gloomy, but it's going to be challenging. This is not done. Um, for the people, you know, the same group that forecasted coronavirus three months before it happened in uh, Event 201, where they did a round table, where they mm-hmm. war gamed a coronavirus coming out of and China. And that's a real thing. They're going to look it up. All, they videotaped yep. it and they put it right there. They war gamed how they were going to deal with social media influencers, how they were going to limit different uh, altering opinions. Um, They've done the same thing with other viruses. They've done it with monkeypox. Even a year ago, monkeypox was said to, you know, it Mm. was uh, open philanthropy by a guy named Dustin Moskowitz. And if you don't know who Dustin Moskowitz is, you should. He is the co-founder of Facebook, and he is one of the biggest investors in gene CRISPR technology. Hmm. which is all about editing the human genome, which these mRNA experimental gene therapies all are preparing for. So, and he put together a, a pamphlet through his society, Open Philanthropy, where they were gamed another outbreak. This time, it was last year, and this is monkeypox, and it was supposed to hmm. come out. I think, uh, the outbreak was supposed to be started in May 15 of 2022, and I think... I think it launched. I think it actually started May 18th. So I think they missed it by a few days. <laughs> but um, there is all the hallmarks of potential. Mm. You know, the next crisis is coming. Mm. That's all I'm saying. Whether it's monkeypox or whether it's the next one, they have 17 other bio agents that that this can be done with. So this is where believers need to be thinking. Okay, this alternative economy. I heard about and we need to be getting involved in this because as you mentioned we don't want to be part of there's definitely going to be two camps 
in this. Absolutely. And it kind of, like, remember the whole like come out of Babylon. Mm-hmm. It's never become more of a real urgent statement than I think right now. And, th- and that can be done in little ways over time. I, don't, I think the good, the, the good news about all this is we're being given the opportunity to see behind the curtain. And we can start making decisions now. And it's not like we're being just thrown into, you mm-hmm. know, the bitter end times, you know, where we have no options and we have to get some mark of the beast. We're seeing technology that could be used for something like mark of the beast or something like that in the future. I don't think it's happened yet, um, but the potential for it or the potential for people or for there to be a digital currency that everyone has to have and for, you know, all those types of things are very, very much on the table right now. In fact, the World Economic Forum is talking about how everyone needs to be tracked mm-hmm. in all times and how health records should be kept digitally on your person, physically on your human. I mean, it's, it's almost as if they're trying to instigate the religious communities into, I don't know, maybe fantasizing more about it. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe, maybe they're, they're, they're trying to provoke a little bit, but they're openly saying this. So I think mm-hmm. we should listen and I think we should be thinking, okay, well, if that happens, what would I do? And if we have enough people around us thinking the same way, then, hell, we need to get a jump start on this, you know? Mm-hmm. And if, if right now, if there's some people that have been doing this for decades, right? Those are the people you learn from, right? Yeah. I'm sure a lot of oh, the yeah. people in your community, it's not, this isn't the first time, you know, they didn't just all jump into this yesterday. I'm sure you had some, some of your more seasoned oh, preppers yeah. that have been there for a while. We all called them crazy 10 years ago. Now we're like, hey, how did you... How did you learn how to can those tomatoes again? (laughs) And it's all what you experienced in the past. So that one person learned how to can tomatoes. The other communications expert, he was in the military. And he, if he's in the the group, if he's there during that Shabbat, no cell phones. Yeah. Absolutely no cell phones. I leave them at home. So very, and, and you know, you look what he's been through and he'll tell you his stories and you're like, oh, he just happens to know things that I don't. Right. Uh, that's all it is. But we, again, we don't need to fear the narrative. I think that's, you know, we get caught in this narrative trap but, and it's not a new thing. This has been happening even since Yeshua's time. Oh, yeah. You know, the narrative is, oh, he's, he's just a rabbi, pay no attention to him. He's, yeah, he's got this little following, it's nothing. And then in the end, well, we'll, we'll get rid of him. You know, and that, this has been going on forever. All this type Absolutely. of thing, where those who are righteous and want God's way to happen, uh, there, there's another force coming against it. Yeah, I think we, I think most of us would rather think that, wow, this is just corruption that just came out of nowhere, and but really, it's been corrupt for a long time. Mm-hmm. We're just now becoming aware of it, and it's becoming so overt. The people behind some of these things are becoming so desperate and wanting to get the world to adopt a new government system which they control mm-hmm. and which they can have control over our choices and where we go, what we do, um, how we pay. And it is, it's happening. I mean, uh, so th- I would say we have to be aware and still not fear it. Most of the people are just kind of closing their, you know, either they're not going to look and that's how they kind of get through. But I really think if, if you let yourself embrace it, really look into it, ask questions, research, look things up for yourself, And at the end of the day, it's going to drive you closer towards the creator. It's going to drive you closer towards your more core beliefs. It might seem a little scary at the beginning, but it's worth it. Well, and if you go to the end of the book, we win. Right. Right. That's it. And and that's another thing, too, is that, uh, first of all, if if evil shows you what it's going to do and who they are, believe it. Yeah. (laughs) And make make decisions to to, to go the opposite way. But as you mentioned... um, you know, you said this is an antichrist system, and it will destroy itself. We don't have to worry about going after it and trying to defeat it. It will. De- we just have to sit back and watch the fire, and, and make plans on our side to uh, survive in the meantime. Yeah, because there's all these you know prophecies about these days from you know Tanakh to the New Testament, um, and it's all about you know there's going to be these assemblies of pockets of people that are going to have protection, provision, and. Um, so that should be where our focus is. Um, at some point, you know, if, if, we, if we call to do something more specific, I think we have to leave that to the creator. And, but if we don't have that specific guidance of any kind, then our job is to simply weather the storm and live in a way where 
we don't need these governments for our survival. And that should be really what we already want anyway. Mm-hmm. Because these governments are not, uh, you know, the, our, our creator, the one that we all serve, is not being represented by any of these governments, including our own. Right, absolutely. And it's not just now that Joe Biden got in office that it hasn't been representing the creator. Mm-hmm. You know, it, this is a bipartisan problem <laughs> in our country and around the world where we're, I mean, we have all of our faith in humans and technology. We have all of our faith in, you know, really pop culture. And, you know, it's kind of a virtue signaling world now. That's kind of how this all spread, right? Everyone was like, well, I don't want to be perceived as the one that doesn't, you know, want to spread the disease. So everyone was doing things that they know was illogical, but they just wanted to be perceived as someone that's helping. Mm-hmm. And that's really sad that we've gotten to that place where we just have to show people how virtuous we are. And that's why I'm going to do these things that don't make sense. And, you know, even just as far as the, uh, as this country goes, that was not the, I mean, that was the whole reason we came out and away from Britain. Yeah. And, uh, you know, people like George Washington and folks like this, they, they were the rebels. Yeah. They were the ones that, that were causing problems, quote unquote, not going along with the narrative. Uh, just pay your taxes, everything will, okay, will be okay. Britain will take care of you. You know, this- <laughs> It's kind of in our blood. It's, yeah, it's, it's not a new thing, especially for us. So, but I think maybe we have been lulled into forgetting that. And we yeah. need to just come out and do these things. And again, it doesn't mean being, uh, you know, violent or anything like that. It's just don't go along with the narrative. Is, is that the key to getting away from all of this? Partly, and it, that's a piece of it. The other piece I would say is let's not let our love of what our country could be replace our desire for the kingdom that is coming. Mm. Because I think sometimes, especially in this country, where we've done, we've had some amazing founders, we've done amazing things, and it's easy to, to get comfortable here. And I think the continuing Bible story is whenever people are in captivity or in a different land, they never want to go back home, do they? Mm. So I think maybe we should all kind of take this in and look at the problems that are existing in our own governments and not really you know, take off our... our um, our bias hat a little bit and think, you know what? It's not all, it it was never about all these countries. It was about a new kingdom that was going to come. And I think that's where we need to put our focus, not on, well, is the house America going to do? I would bet America's probably going to do what China's going to do. Yeah. And that's unfortunate. Yeah. But regardless, it has nothing to do with what this new kingdom is going to (laughs) be. Well, and the good thing is, even if it does go that way, we have to remember the Israelites. I mean, these, these things that happened to the Israelites happened as a lesson for us, where even though they were in the midst of evil going on around them, uh, and, and all the gods being destroyed one by one by the plagues that Jehovah brought, the people were protected. Yeah. Though Jehovah's people were protected. They, were they brought out of Egypt and then Egypt was destroyed? No. They went right through it. They went right through it, and they were, but they were protected through the whole thing. And I think an important, point, uh, important uh, thing that I'm hearing you say is that we have to be careful that although that we, we love where we live and love the freedoms that we have and all of these American ideals, we have to be careful not to make the United States of America an idol. Absolutely. Or even the idea Absolutely. of what we think it is an idol. And... We should still, I mean, it, we've done an, a, great, a great experiment here, right? This has been a phenomenal experiment, but it was never the end goal for any of anyone with our, our worldview. Hmm. It doesn't mean we can't be a blessing to it, but it is not, we, are, we should have our eye focused on a different kingdom. And it doesn't, it exists here, but it only exists here amongst us. <laughs> and we need to make it exist here. And we need to live in a way that is, is, um, reliant on this future kingdom as possible. Mm-hmm. And that's really what's being tested. We're, we are going to have a lot of choices in the coming years. And it, one, a, a series of choices will be very convenient. It'll be very um, popular. And um, we're going to have a choice of whether we want to impress our friends, family, people that we you know, work with coworkers. We're gonna we're gonna have a lot of these, a series of these decisions. What's more important? 
Yeah. And I think a lot of people have already had those moments, right? What's more important? We yep. have these mandates and things that people are being forced to do. Wow. So we all have to, there's going to be a moment, if you haven't put your, if you haven't dug your feet in yet, there's going to be a moment where you have to. Mm-hmm. Your moment may not, maybe hasn't come yet, but the moment's coming for all of us. All right. Thank you, David. Hold that thought. All right. Well, some very sobering things to think about on this episode of Shabbat Night Live, and we're going to continue more after the break. Thank you for making it possible. Your donations make this show happen. We're going to give you a couple of minutes to do more of that. We'll be right back. Thank you for supporting Shabbat Night Live. You know, these days it kind of seems like going west. Going west, young man, is where we're at again. <laughs> we're just kind of starting all anew. And uh, David, before the break, we were talking about how uh, it, it's important to start community. And it's almost like we're starting from scratch again. Like I said, the, the wagon's going west and stake your claim. This is mine. Who are you? Who are you who's living around me? Can we... You know, live together. Can we can we agree with one another? We're going to protect each other, have each other's back. That's kind of where we're at here again, because we have forces uh, against us. Um, you know, when the wagons were moving west, they had other forces against them, and then we have forces against us here. So we need to create things all over again. They they had to create towns. They had to create banks. They had to start all over. And so is that where we're at? I mean, last episode, last week, we were talking about uh, alternative economies uh, a little bit. That kind of thing. So um, let's talk more about that. So uh, having an alternative economy and uh, Bitcoin, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about that. Why is that so different? It's, it's different because it can't be controlled by any single person. And that's what makes it different than every, mm. every other type of currency out there. It's just technology that exists now. It's people operating machinery and using, and it, but there's no control over it. Mm. There's no management control over it. There's no C-suite. There's no executive right. control. Now, what of those who say, well, this is all a big trap. It's, it's all going to be taken over anyway, and then uh, a government coin is going to be made the, uh, the the standard, and everything else is going to be illegal. I mean, well, it's partly true. Yeah? That's partly true. Um, eventually, Bitcoin won't be taken over. And really, the only way for Bitcoin to really be taken down would be for a global internet outage. You know, mm -hmm. which it would have to take down all of the nodes. Or for everyone to make it illegal all to of, accept it or something. All the or... nodes would have, no, that would just move it. Uh, that's true, right? It doesn't stop Bitcoin. Right. That's exactly why it's so important. Mm. Even if the U.S. does ban it, 
there may be time where you don't want to live here. Mm -hmm. And or there might be a time where you want to live in a certain region here, right? right? And I, that's already happened for a lot of people, as we talked about. So we're going to all, uh, humans will go to the path mm. of least resistance. We will go to where freedom is more attainable, mm -hmm. or where we perceive it to be more attainable. And this is going to cause a major blessing for many countries and many regions. The ones that choose to remain open to freedom of speech, freedom of expression, they're going to grow right now because mm -hmm. if you notice the oligarchs of this world, they have monopolies over technology right now, and blockchain is one of them. That's why what China's doing mm -hmm. with their central you know currency that they started. So the oligarchs, we have the technology to basically free finances for for everyone, mm. but it's controlled. And so mm -hmm. the big question is, where is it going to go? Which countries are going to embrace it, and where is freedom going to prosper? It's interesting that, you know, we mentioned something we want to talk about here. I jotted down. We want to talk about how God will lead us step by step. Yehovah leads us step by step. And he, you might think, well, he's not telling me the next step. How do I know? But if we look back, you know, it's even just funny, funny things that you notice that uh, it didn't seem like they were steps, but they are. So a, lo a lot of Americans in this, in this country have a, a problem with the borders right now with the, the current administration, what they're allowing to happen. So there's open borders. Yet, if going to find freedom means we just are able to cross borders freely, maybe we want that eventually. <laughs> there could very easily be a day where we want that border open. Yeah. You know, and I think everyone should. Uh, doesn't should look positive all, right now. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons why it's negative, but no, we see your point. We should all be thinking about contingencies. Mm -hmm. Everything's about contingencies. If you're building a community, you should also be thinking of what other communities can we ally with, right? Mm -hmm. Because you don't know if you're building your your get out retreat center right beside a place where there's going to be nuclear fallout. Right. I'm not saying that's likely, but I'm saying the point is, whatever our plans are, we need to be malleable. We need to be able to shift, and we need to. It needs to be community centered, not you know structure centered, or, or you know, because a lot of times what people can do is, if you invest everything into this one plot of land, very hard to leave it. Mm -hmm. That's why a lot of Egyptians. That's why in Egypt a lot of the Hebrews didn't want to go out into this desert. We knew how to. It wasn't fun, but we knew we could eat. Yep. Right here, right. We're gonna march out in a desert with no water. Right. And so I think we need to always be considering that we're going to be stretched and whatever our plan is right now, it could mm -hmm. absolutely change. But as long as the, the center of the plan is true community, resilience among that community, mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's going to, I think it's, it's, it's the way forward. Uh, Something that comes to mind when you mention these words, uh, so we need to be malleable, we need to be stretched. Uh, I, I thought when you were saying those things, I thought of the word fluid. Yeah. So all being able to move, and, and what, what is the ultimate fluid? Uh, water, spirit. So we need to be of this, going with the spirit, as it were, uh, to just, that's how God is gonna take us step by step. We listen to him. Even another thing, we mentioned the borders as just sort of a, a what some would call a coincidence. Oh, isn't that interesting? You're talking about the borders, but really we wanna maybe cross that border freely. Did you notice when we had the pandemic, when everything was being locked down and everybody was being forced inside and to be keep, kept away from each other, what industry popped up that, well, it was always there, but it, it just exploded because people craved freedom somehow, some way, the RV industry. It went nuts because people wanted to be able to get out and be free and do what they wanted anyway. And is that a lesson for us to learn perhaps? And God is saying, don't get too attached to your house, have a way to go somewhere and then go from there to another place if you need to. Absolutely. Maybe there's a reason behind this RV explosion. It's um, common, you know, we're all, we're all getting to see what we're all about as long as we build it off of relationships first, mm -hmm. right? And it's not, you know, where we're picking a plot of land and making our whole game plan around, you know, safeguarding this one area, we should be thinking about how do we create a network? Mm -hmm. These networks are all we're gonna have. And the larger, I would love to see 
certain parts of the U.S., you know, really create those larger bastions of freedom. Like a, a, an example of that, like Florida. Florida's a lot more of a, a free state right now mm-hmm. than many of the other states. And you're seeing that the, the part of the response to that is booming, you know, economy and real estate. I mean, they're, they're, it's, it's amazing how many people are moving down there. But it's just showing you what's in people's minds. People are going to continue this trend. Mm-hmm. And as the as more strict measures are implemented over these next years, which I would anticipate they will, um, you're going to see a lot more RVs being sold. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to see a lot more um, boats being bought because people are mm-hmm. going to be looking for those contingencies. Where can I go? How can I get out of here? And mm-hmm. so maybe there is a positive to this uh, open border scenario, which there's definitely negatives to it, but there, mm-hmm. there may be a day where we're glad we didn't, we didn't finish. And you know, it's in those scenarios where we don't know until we're forced into it. Uh, like if you've never gone camping before, you know that uh, uh, T- Ted Clayton, our, our CEO, is, is an avid camper. And he'll be the first to tell you, no matter what campground he goes to, you, know, you pull in and no sooner than 10 minutes later, people are greeting one another. They don't care where you're from. You're all part of this camper community uh, because you all have the same, like we talked about before, the same mindset. So we, we have that same spirit, that same mindset. He'll tell you the same thing about his ham radio community. Same thing. Everyone has the same ideals. They all agree to the same general community rules and they all abide by them because it's a separate thing that they can own, they can control, and not have to worry about some overarching government to tell them what to do. And as long as we can um, maintain a, a style of community that, you know, the only negative side potentially is the walls that we've put up mm-hmm. between each other, whether that's because of our religious beliefs, our differing doctrines. We put up these walls a lot of times. So sometimes... The Catholics won't mix with the, you know, the mm-hmm. pro- everyone's yeah. kind of gets sectioned off. And I think, I think if anything has shown us, you know, the, whatever walls we think there are, it's irrelevant in the scope of what we're dealing with. Mm-hmm. And the way I look at all of those, you know, more like kind of touchy religion by religion issues, they're not going to matter soon. All we're going to care about is who else really wants to be free and eventually, we're all going to have a new realization of what it means to truly, what this kingdom really is. Mm-hmm. None of us really know. Right? Right. <laughs> we're kind of piecing things together, yeah. but we've all got something wrong. I'm positive I have a number of things wrong in my current beliefs that I think are right right now. And if we just let, if we just let this time, you know, there's the, I think it's Jeremiah 31 where it talks about how there's going to be an age where there's universal knowledge of God's ways. And no one's going to have to teach us anymore. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm banking on. But until that happens, I used to be someone that could get really divided on little issues. I'm just done with it. Mm -hmm. I don't know how that can even matter anymore. I mean, it's... And you think about, again, how when we see things in the media, that, that, that putting up the walls and, well, I don't believe like you do and I do a different calendar than you do and this kind of thing, just little totally. issues, That's even just in the Torah community. That's a great is example. Uh, yeah, we're doing the same thing. Right, and, and the more we do that, the more we play into evil's agenda of keeping us separated, divide and conquer. This is not a new scenario. This is an old, old strategy where if you can get the people to fight against each other, now they're not working together and you can control them. It's elitism. Mm-hmm. And, and we all, I think we all crave the feeling of being a little bit elite. And, and that's sometimes what keeps us segmented into our, our you know, these are my tent poles over here. Mm-hmm. You go over there. If the last two years didn't do it, the next years will beat that out of us. <laughs> It doesn't matter. Eventually, you're going to stop caring. So you might as well just save yourself yeah. the, the heartache. And in the words <laughs> of Bill Gates, if the last one didn't get their attention, the next one will. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, goodness. So, But God will show us what to do. Yehovah will show us what to do step by step. I mean, it's... We're watching his plan right. unfold right now. I honestly think that the contrast to God that we're seeing right now is the greatest evidence of God. How do you see that? What do you mean? Well, right now, I can. I, there's atheists I know that are coming up to me like they're finally realizing how evil some of these people can be. The people trying to actually implement these strategies. They don't have a religious worldview like mine, but they now know evil exists. How does evil exist? 
to an atheist. Think about it. Hmm. What I'm saying is the realization of God is happening to different people right now in different ways. And it may not even be that they're realizing there is a God yet. It may be that they're just realizing, oh my gosh, there really is evil. And now it's making their mind work. Mm-hmm. Okay, is there a counter to this? Is there, a, you know what I'm saying? Because yeah. what we're saying is if there's evil, if there is a real evil entity, then there's something greater outside of humanity that's not us that's causing that. I mean, that's where it leads. Hmm. So I think it's, it's kind of interesting. It's kind of like, it's almost like evangelizing the world in a way, not to one particular uh, viewpoint, but it's definitely showing us the contrast to the creator's nature. And by contrasting it, it's making more people question, you know what, maybe there is something, you know? Yep. And I think that's, that's going to be interesting to watch. Yeah, to watch. Absolutely, yeah. And, and even just if you don't recognize it as evil necessarily being an atheist, well, even they do, but it's, wait a minute, this person is forcing me into a life that, I don't want that life. You're, you're pushing me there. I don't want to go there. It may be as simple as, it, they may look at us and go, you know what? I don't believe any of the things they do, but I'm with those people. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm right. saying? Yeah. Because of what they believe in and because of the, the moral stances that they're taking about their freedoms. And mm-hmm. that is as spiritual as anything. You know? So, I mean, God has a way of drawing people in his own way that maybe we don't think, you know, fit, you know, or maybe they just don't seem like they're, you know, on the same uh have the same mindset, it doesn't matter. He's drawing people his own way. Right, and mindset is, is the big thing behind, um, we've talked about this with a couple of other guests and you have a perspective on this too, the mark of the beast. So this thing is not you know, where Christians thought they were doing the right thing and oh no, I took the mark of the beast, I was wrong, now I'm condemned to hell. It's, not, some, it's not a trick. It's not a trick. It's we, not, it can't be a trick. If it is a trick, then we need to really look at uh, you know, that whole text, because in the text, whoever, in, in Revelation, whoever takes the mark is condemned, right? And I just, I, I, I told you this in the, uh, before we came on, it really bothered me. This, this whole passage really bothered me. The idea that someone could do something and it seals your fate by the way it reads, it made me reach the conclusion that in order for this to be righteous, Mm -hmm. in a fair ruling, which I believe all of them are, the person would have to know exactly what they're signing up for. It couldn't be I accidentally, you know, got this shot and now I've taken the mark of the beast and I'm damned. And it doesn't matter how how much of a life I dedicated to the creator before that. No, this is all merciful. The fact that we're being allowed to see behind the curtain, to Mm. see how evil some of these people can be, it, I don't think the mark of the beast has has entered onto the scene yet. But I think we are all seeing potential capabilities, technologies, and universal uh, international mandates that will be implemented to create that effect. Right. And that's what we need to keep our mind. And just knowing that as a person of faith, it should go back to community, Right. Because when you can't go to Sam's Club, because you're you now you don't you have a digital identifier on you and you have a social credit score and you have one currency that exists in your country and no others, you better have some contingencies mm-hmm. <laughs> in place. Because if you don't, this is where it's going to get tough for people. This is where um, imagine you're a father with you have know, your family, you have your kids. And now your decision is, are my kids going to go hungry for me not to get this? Mm. And there is going to be that very difficult decision for a lot of people. But again, the merciful part is right now we're being, we're being awakened. We have the opportunity to make preparations, mm-hmm. to live differently, to live, to live in a way that makes this world and this governing world less relevant to our daily lives. And that, if we do that, Put all the political stuff aside. We're not gonna, we're not, there's no political salvation here that's right. gonna happen. It's not gonna happen. I don't know I'm, who needs to hear that. I think someone needs to hear that. Mm-hmm. It's not gonna be fixed. Yep. But we can be fixed. And that's the difference. We, we don't have to keep trusting in um, 
someone to swoop in and save America and restore it to its glory days. I don't think it's happening. But we can get ready ourselves and we can be ready for the real kingdom that's coming. Absolutely. And that means coming together. And another example of that is we see uh, crowdfunding being a very popular thing in the last few years. Absolutely. If people can all come together and give a little bit to the community cause, whatever it is, and that all of a sudden that person is now saved. They have the money they need for the operation or whatever the crowdfunding was for. That should make all of us have a light bulb moment and say, wait a minute, if all of us come together and offer our skills together as a community, we could survive? Yes. If we, if we blend, if we uh, share each other's risks a little bit, mm -hmm. kind of like what we're paying insurance companies to do for us mm -hmm. with like-minded people and create the infrastructure internally for you know physicians and people to work internally, it's all very doable. We have all the technology to do this. Yep. We can do this. It's just, you know, will, will we let these warning signs wake us up now or will we kick the can and will we wait for something a little bit worse? And I, I hope, I hope most people are, are awake now. And I, yeah. I think, I think it has, I think almost, if we had had this conversation two years ago, it probably wouldn't have done well. <laughs> no, <laughs> you know? well, there's nothing to spur people to do anything. Right. Yeah. And, and, but now I think there's a lot of people for the first time in their lives willing to, uh, to consider you know, other options. So mm -hmm. again, this is all a blessing that we're going through. And the only thing things. stopping us from doing this is to allow any kind of narrative that says, you need to stay away from your neighbor. Absolutely. Because with, with, that's the only way we survive is together. We don't, su we don't survive apart. We need Especially if, you know, <laughs> I mean, we have to ask questions. If someone tells us, not to do something. We say, well, why not? And then we need to see what's the risk, right? Mm -hmm. And as someone says, you can't ask those questions, we already kind of know, right? <laughs> it's like, it's almost like by default. Like if someone says you can't ask those questions or you're crazy, that's an intimidation tactic, mm -hmm. right? That's not a logic, that's not logic based. We should all be asking why we're doing what we're doing. I remember I had mm -hmm. a friend that loved to golf and, um, before the pandemic started, he was almost like begging for, you know, lockdowns and stuff. And the moment his golf got taken away, he was done with it. He was like, this is the way he was like the most like <laughs> rebel guy in the group it, it, for everyone. It's something different, but mm. we all have to have our wake up call for him. It was golf. Right? <laughs> wow. All right. Thanks, David. And thank you, too. Thank you for joining us on Shabbat Night Live. We will see you next week. Until then, Shavua Tov. Have a good one. And we will see you again on Shabbat Night Live. Shalom, Torah fans. Give this video a thumbs up and share it with a friend. Tap the subscription button and the bell icon. And I promise to update weekly with in-depth biblical research. Be sure to download the new MichaelRood.tv app for both mobile and home devices for even more commercial-free content.